What's up, guys? Scott here from Chernobyl Studios, and um, never thought this day would happen, but sitting here with me is Carl Sanders of Nile. Now, Nile are a technical death metal band from the States who've been spreading the gospel of death metal since the 90s, but if you don't know that, I don't even know why you're watching this channel. <laughs> All right, so, however, what Carl does not know, and what most of you don't know, is that listening to his guitar tone is essentially directly responsible for me trying to understand how speakers work better getting away from the v30s trying out different cabs and combinations because i really just enjoyed his sound and he would always talk about like oh i use the cream batch or the 65 you know these things and i was like i don't know what this is so carl is instrumental in me trying to develop my own um character and my own voice as a guitarist so anyway today we're going to sit here we're going to chat about a little bit about nile uh songwriting process and uh, well, I mean, you'll figure it out when, when you, the video is over. You'll understand what we talked about. So, Carl, how's it going, man? Hey, doing fine, Scott. Good to see you, brother. It's actually been about a year to the day, actually. Depends when this video comes up. We're uh, Vile Niotic Rights. You released it. So, uh, it was open to a very strong reception, of course. Very positive. But it's been about a year. People have had a chance to sit with it, digest it, and overanalyze it. Um, what's the consensus? <laughs> where, where would you put this uh, release with other Nile releases? Uh, you know, uh, for me personally, I, I'd put it up, you know, I don't know that you can say there's a best Nile record because people got their favorites. Um, but I, I certainly would call it a contender. It, it can sit alongside any of the classics. Um, for me, I mean, that's not, not to say that's for everybody. Because if you ask somebody else, they're going to go, no, man, Annihilation of the Wicked, or In Their Dark and Shrines, or, you know, and and that's okay with me. That's absolutely fine with me. Um, but I can say, without a shred of a doubt, that this one earned me the least amount of internet hate of any Nile record we've ever done, ever. <laughs> go on. I'm very curious to learn why, if you know why. Um, well, you know, we've been doing now records for, you know, 25 years or so, right? And, uh, not all of the ones that people rave about today were as unanimous, unanimous, unanimously, yeah, accepted by everybody. They all had differing levels of hate. In fact... Dark and Shrines earned me so much hate that I actually had to go talk to somebody because it was just overwhelming. Uh, Annihilation of the Wicked. Me. Nope. Not kidding you. There was so much hate on that album. That's incredible. I never would have, I mean, because that's an album. Oh, it's a staple of Nile. That's Nile. Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. Annihilation of the Wicked. Same thing. We changed drummers. We, you know, took it on a little bit of different path, earned a big pile of hate. But now people will, like, swear on that album like it's the Bible. You know, out of all the records we've done, the Vile Nihilotic Rites has earned the least amount of backlash of any record we ever, ever did, ever in our fucking history. We slaved on that record, though. Uh, we spent so much time getting it right. Um... Then I'm really happy about it. If someone says, hey, Carl, what, what's your best fucking album? I'm going to go, the fucking new one. Fucking duh. Because, uh, you know, like all the stuff that we've learned so far along the path, and, you know, there have been some tragic learning mistakes along the way. You know, uh, when you're on the bleeding edge, you know, you get a nosebleed. And we've gotten quite a few of them. So, but hopefully, you know, some of those lessons, you know, if you pay a high price for it, you should put it to use. And that's what we did, or at least tried to do with Vile and Nilotic Rights. Take all the things that we learned that we did wrong, that we did right, and try and use it and move forward. I have to really give it to you. Like, you can, there's a difference between technical death metal, anyone can do that, in my opinion, and then making it groovy which is what you do. When, when, when I get to actually sit down and listen to your riffs and, under, and they're like, oh, shit, okay, it's whatever the, whatever the key signature is, doesn't matter, but it's grooving. There's, there's like, this is the headbanging part. All right, cool. 
And then, so that's a real skill. And I really felt that a lot with the new album where there are melodies getting stuck in my head where I wake up and it's like, oh yeah, okay. Got to go play that song now. Uh, and I think that's really difficult to do in technical death metal. I mean, just in general, as a songwriter, it's difficult to do, but technical death metal is even, I think, would be like the heart of the hard expert mode uh, of, of that. So There's so many challenges with the musical form. Like it's, it's very compressed. You know, there's a lot of things going on in a short amount of time that are completely filling up both the frequency spectrum and the available time, right? All the time all the space, all the frequencies are all getting fucking used. So, you know, to actually take all that and turn it into something meaningful that someone's going to give a shit about is, you know, I, I think the, the calling, you know, what are we doing here anyway, playing metal? What purpose do we have when, it, when it's all said and done? Are we doing something that adds something positive to the universe? Well, we ought to be. <laughs> we ought to be, right? We ought to be, you know? We should be making some music that means something to people, that people get something from. Or else, why should we be allowed to do it? Well, I mean, you've earned, like you mentioned, you know, the 25 years of making records. A, that's very that's a very small short list of people or bands, I should say, that can even say they've done that. Much less, like, in metal, in, in your guys' genre. And um, it just seems to be the guys who started in your era, the 80s and 90s, who are still doing it. And then all the other bands that happened after that have just been really fag-based, in my opinion. Like, here's the new metal crowd, here's the alternative metal crowd. Very few of them, you know, make it through or whatever. And it's not like you changed your sound from 19, you know, 97 to 2007. There's no real characteristic difference. It just became more Nile. <laughs> it became like <laughs> super more Nile. Like from the old school days of using those cakewalk MIDI trumpets to getting a nice trumpet library. You know what I mean? Dude, that was actually my Roland GR1 guitar synth on those first couple of records a Roland guitar synth that's that's why they you know by today's standards it's pretty awful uh but that's all I had to work with you know it's like yeah but I mean that's the difference I mean even back then pushing going beyond just like okay here's the cool chromatic death metal riff you're like here's the cool chromatic death metal riff in a completely different non-western scale with you know, old instrument, atm you know, atmosphere stuff being added to it. You know, and like I said, in the beginning, uh, I had no fucking idea what you're trying to do. So I was like, okay, yeah, it's heavy, it's cool. But I mean, it didn't really, you know, make it into my brain yet. But I mean, you know, Nile, everyone knows Nile or should know Nile. Seriously, it's ridiculous if you don't know Nile. But um, I want to talk about what you do on, on your side project stuff because sorry and meditations. All right, it's already like 16 years old, but there's a particular song on there uh, of the sleep of Ishtar. Now, the, why am I picking this song out? Because what I just said, you use a lot of non-Western scales or just the, the old exotic type of sounds. But this particular sound literally sounds like you just took the 80s scale and you made a sweet melodic solo over it. And I thought back and I never really, it's unchar uncharacteristic of you in terms of songwriting where it's, overly melodic uh very it just spoke to me more i'm a huge 80s metal fan go ahead and rip me apart but i mean uh that particular song is super atmospheric with the guitar solo and the classic trademark nile tone is still on it um do you remember how that song happened i mean i know it was 15 years ago but i mean actually it goes back even further because I, I played that song first with uh band called Mariah um, different set of guys uh, the drummer was the same though Pete Hamora the original drummer of now he and I played in that band for years um, so we had done that song and it was you know very similar uh, and it had gotten played on a local radio station you know local bands blah 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 but that's as far as it went well I had the song laying around for years after that and knew, hey, man, I could do 
so much of a better version of that nowadays. Now that I know a little bit more what I was doing, right? So, so I said, all right, okay, I'm going to redo this song and I'm going to do it the best I can possibly do it, you know, at, at that time, um, using the available instrumentation that I had laying around the house. Was that, so that previous project was more in that style, like more melodic sounding in general? Um, it was like a, a thrash metal kind of band with, you know, power metal leanings. But okay. like if you took a Queensryche kind of singer, but you stuck him with a guitar player who was listening to Slayer Metallica and a drummer who was like Bill Ward. And, uh, you know, that's what it sounded like. Okay, that's fair. Um, I did read in an interview like long ago that that all those ideas were happening because you're on tour all the time, blasting metal all the time. Uh, is that actually true? And then uh, when did you realize like, hey, I got a lot of ideas here. I should do a solo album. How did that happen? Well, uh, that's exactly correct. I was on tour, and back in those days, we were touring relentlessly. Uh, Nefrika, Black Seeds, uh, that era relentless because we're trying to make a you know trying to make our mark and opportunity presented itself so we toured seven u.s tours um in 98 and yeah it's just so much metal every fucking day so when i go home or when we'd have a day off i needed something quiet i need something soothing so i could just chill the fuck out death metal all day every day you, you lose your mind after a while i wanted something to chill so i started playing this music and um we were on tour and we were visiting the relapse uh, records headquarters in pennsylvania and they said yeah 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 if you want to chill like on your day off here and you know play your music or whatever in, in the back room or whatever, that's fine. So that's what I was doing. I was working on some of those Saurian tunes. They weren't called Saurian yet, but Matt Jacobson heard it. Matt was like, dude, this fucking shit's killer. You should share this with people. And I went, are you sure, you know, I got a, a death metal audience. Uh, are you sure? And he goes, yes, yes, dude, dude share it with people so that's what we did we we went ahead and we we made the record and you know enough people liked it to warrant another one dude not even just enough people but you can go on youtube right now any video of saurian people are like oh when's the next saurian coming out jesus christ it's a masterpiece so carl is there going to be a new saurian anytime soon or what the hell's going on Dude, uh, it's what I've been doing with myself these last couple months. I've been holed up here writing. Got 10 songs so far. Pre-production's all done. I start retracking all the guitars Thursday. Yeah, Thursday in a local studio. Holy crap. Is Are you trying to do that, trying to get it out this year, or is that going to be a, a next year thing? Um, it might be the end of this year or just the very beginning, just however it falls. Yeah. Anything you can tell us about that? Or are we going to keep that super tight-lipped? Well, I mean, what do you want to know? Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, so uh, it's conce is there is there a concept based around this one? The first one was conceptual, Ooh. second one's conceptual. Yeah, yeah, this is definitely a concept. It's, in fact, it's such a big concept that there's also a companion book that goes with it that explains all the songs, it, like, tells a story. It's, it's kind of like... Edgar Rice Burroughs or H.P. Lovecraft kind of story, you know, it's, yeah, it's really whacked. Oh, that's another thing you're really well known for. And actually one thing that I always found super interesting as a kid were your liner notes. So it doesn't surprise me at all that you wrote a book to help explain what the hell's going on with the music. Uh, that's really cool. So, I mean, has, has, the current year been helpful in stirring some ideas for that project or were these ideas you've already had and you just finally uh, decided to get them ready? A few of them, uh, were actually had a few years on them already. So I've, uh, written a few things. Um, great story behind the song, uh, that's called school fuck ritual. Um, good name. Uh, a couple of years back, 
uh, this couple who were getting married hired me to compose a wedding march. They said, dude, uh, we want to walk down the aisle to something that, you know, sounds like Saurian meditation. Uh, can you write a wedding march? And they wrote me a big fat check. So I couldn't say no, right? <laughs> so I wrote them this piece of music so that they can walk down the aisle. And it turned out so ridiculously well that I went, you know what? If we took out all the, the wedding parts of this, the rest of this shit is pretty fucking evil. So it... it 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 like has a a part B. Uh, it's it's one of the tracks on there. It's one of my favorites. It's like, yeah, it's called School Fuck Ritual. It's it's wonderful. I love it. Yeah, that's a really good name. Never would have, that's never would have thought that that would be the story behind a song with a name like that. And speaking of that, I mean, I know you got a lot of instrument libraries. And uh, again, because of you, an interview, or maybe it was a Facebook post that you made about uh, Eduardo. Like, I love Eduardo's stuff. He makes the best shit. And I went to his website, and there was Dark Era. I'm like, oh, I'm buying that. And so I bought Dark Era, and I used it, actually, on Visitor Keter of, of the recent... Right. I, I, yeah, I saw that. I watched the video, and it was really nice. Um, awesome product. <laughs> worth every single penny um like i know this uh, uh question is impossible but like is there a is there a specific library that you just it's your favorite but i mean most likely can't answer that so maybe uh when you're using a library or looking for a library um what kind of functionality is like required for it to be useful for you well uh i do have a favorite and it is an eduardo terralante library it's called uh uh Ancient Persia or Ancient Era Persia. Yeah, dude, dude. He writes the most genius fucking shit. His original motto was samples with soul. All right. Uh, the first one I saw ever from him was one called Sampled Landscape, which is just a bunch of different atmospheres, right? But he puts his magic in there and he makes very playable instruments, right? They're not just static kind of libraries where you press a keyboard and something happens no you, you play his stuff like which is what i look for if i'm going to actually make use of a library it's got to be playable like the different parameters have to be real-time adjustable like you know the vibrato speed you know the uh, how much pick noise is on it or you know the how much breath or what's the decay what's the release what's the attack you know all these things you know like need to be easily assignable and real time adjustable so that you can play the VST and breathe some life into it cuz there's nothing worse man than than listening to somebody's record and you just hear a bunch of static one note, bing, 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 bing. And they, they put like zero effort into actually making it musical, right? I mean, there's a lot of components to like even just touching a guitar. You know, the way you touch a guitar, the way you hold the pick, the force you play it, the... You know, there's there's a million little variables, and it's that way with every single instrument. So, for a library to be useful, you've got to be able to access and play in real time the different, you know, parameters of the sound. It's it's a must. Got to have. Got to have. That's a really good point. Like I I had I didn't really know what you were gonna how you were gonna answer that question, but. The way you've answered it now makes more sense um, as to why the Saurian stuff sounded so legitimate. Where um, A, being able to play it, right? Like, okay, here's like how it plays insofar as instead of programming it. And that's something I'm getting into now. I just bought my first mini controller ever. Nice. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And um, wow, it makes it a lot easier. <laughs> Which controller did stuff. you get? I got an Arturia 61 Key Lab. 
R2 very Rio. nice, very nice. I'm sure Did it's got l- some little assignable controllers, right? CC. That's why I bought it. It's got eight CC lanes where I can just go like this on it, and then I'm like trying to understand if I can use it to do automation real time. Yes, yes. Cubase lets you uh, do quick learn with it, and the Cubase quick controls make this like so easy. It's like falling off a log. I mean, Great. Jesus Christ. I'm tired, of pro- yeah, I'm tired of programming it with my fucking mouse. <laughs> uh, like oh, like I did in too, the video but... series. <laughs> right, you just draw it with the pencil. That's fun, but there's nothing like doing it. Like you got one hand on the keyboard, the other hand on your controller, uh, you know, got your mod wheel close by. So you can like do stuff as you play it. Exactly. That's what I'm. That's what I'm want to get into because that's where the realism comes in. You know, like and now it makes a lot more sense with what you're saying. Being able to, yeah, change the pick attack of the or the scrape or oh, this is going to be a mistake here. So it sounds very realistic. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's that's why it's so much better to fucking play it. Don't fucking write it. Play it because if you play it, there's genuine humanity genuine musicality in it uh i got a guy i work with and bless his heart he writes in sibelius which is you know it's it's a great program all right but it makes terrible terrible fodder for vsts it's it's awful yeah so are you talking about like everything's everything's not in the right octave or you can't read the MIDI note? Like Guitar Pro loves doing that. It's all fucking shifted down an octave. No, what it is, it's it's all it's all perfect. It's written oh, in there and it's gotcha. it's perfect. And it's like Really? I mean, ah to to my ear is it's cringeworthy. I can't stand it. Like I I hate to say this too, but I, I hear a lot of metal records that are cringeworthy because I know there's some guy sitting in a room with a, a keyboard this big who's going bing, 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 and I'm like, dude, it's possible to actually use these tools to make pleasant music if you give a fuck, if you take the time to to learn how it's done. It's going all the way to the extreme of using the technology, right? Like, you know, uh, one of my big things why I can't listen to a lot of music is fucking Kick 10 and Snare 12. I hear that, I'm done. I peace out. I'm good. I can't hear anything else except that. And actually, I refuse to use that product in general because I don't want it. I don't even know what it is. What is Slate Trigger. Slate Trigger. Slate. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. It's just Kick 10, Snare 12, and as, as much as I loved Iced Earth, the, the last Demon and Wizards album is just a slate preset on the drums. Right. And I, I can't do it. I'm just like, I was, I pre-ordered the album, and I was so, like, personally insulted. Like, how in the piss does Demon and Wizards have a fucking slate preset for drum sounds? It just drives me insane. But, I mean, that's a whole different thing. But, I mean, like... It'd be different if uh, they played it or it wasn't quantized so heavily. It would be okay then, but it's offensive when you when you hear that. It, like it, it offends your in- intelligence. It's it's insulting to hear. Like really, really. I mean, I'm not against drum. Like here's the thing. I'm not against drum editing. I'm not against editing in general. It's like it doesn't bother me. What I'm against is like. Okay, that's a Mar- that's a Mesa V thirties and uh, kick ten, awesome. W- which is which is literally everything in the last fifteen years. Which is fine. Holy shit, we're not like gonna try to burn down the house. But I mean, like you, when you're talking about all the different speakers you use, I'm like, oh, what the hell is that? I just went out and bought a fuckload of Celestian speakers impulses <laughs> and just listened to them all. Like, oh, I don't I don't know that. I don't like that one. I like that one. I like that. Oh, this is cool. I like that one. And then it just sort of works out where, like, I don't like to be 30s anymore. I, I don't know. It depends on, you know, for me, what you're trying to do with it. Like, I don't like the V30 to play a power chord with distortion through it. But I like it for a guitar solo. I really like it for a guitar solo. Yeah. Well, there's a different application of it. Probably maybe with the pronounced mids helping it cut, it differentiates from what you're doing with the rhythm tone. Yes. Yes, exactly. 
Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I love how you get so excited, Carl. You just you're still like a kid. You know what I mean? <laughs> that last Instagram post where you played the acoustic guitar, left a comment on that. You're playing all good shit, and the video ends, and you're just like, <laughs> just so, like, it, like it works, mom. Can you believe it? I mean, it's so awesome it is seeing you have so much fun after all this time. Because shit, it's easy to get into the zone of not having fun. I I hate that zone. I fucking hate that zone. I have to spend so much time in that zone that, like, I don't want to go there unless there's, like, something tangible going to come out of it, right? Because in the end, we're making music that's supposed to be enjoyable on some level. If I'm banging my head, right, or running around in the mosh pit, well, I'm having fun. To me, that's fun, okay? So that's, like... I'm getting something from it. If if I'm like going into the zone, but I'm just beating myself up down there, I start going, well, wait a minute. What is my purpose? What is my life being consumed for? Uh, we, Yeah, we need to make this count for something. I appreciate that a lot. And it's very interesting that, I mean, um, that you have that perspective. I mean, and that's probably another reason why Niall is never in the gossip newspaper and does stupid shit. Uh, that a lot of other bands have done <laughs> uh, over the course of their time. <laughs> Listen, uh, you don't have to incriminate yourself. Feel free to plead the fifth here, Carl. It's not a big deal. I've done plenty of stupid shit. I just try not to put it on Facebook. No, I'm 35, so I'm very happy that I grew up still in the time where our phones didn't have fucking cameras in them. So all the dumb shit I did is not recorded for antiquity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm very thankful for that too. The '80s were so much ridiculous fun. If you were a guy playing metal back in the '80s, which that that's what I was, it was so much ridiculous fun to be had. It was the Reagan years. Everybody had disposable income. Everybody was having fun. Yeah, and metal was huge. It was a great time to be alive. But it wouldn't have been as much fun. If uh, you could see what you did on Facebook the next day, <laughs> right? Like, oh my God, it, I gotta, someone take my phone away from me when I start drinking, Jesus. It totally changed touring um, because for a lot of guys, like the shit that they used to do on the other side of the planet and their wives and girlfriends would never know about it. Okay. But now it's like, Everything you do, it's like, it's not Big Brother exactly. What what would be the equivalent? Just like everyone's, just everyone's watching. Yeah, all your neighbors are watching kind of deal. And the stupider it is, the stupider that it is, the more likely that someone's going to repost it and people are going to look at it just because it is stupid. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like I hate talking to people all the time. I just, it's it's too much. It's too much. You know, I don't care to know that much. I mean, let me put it like this. If you and I were to, uh, to, to get to know one another, I would prefer to know you through communication and just knowing who you are, not like see one of your worst moments on Facebook, but just a complete fucking accident. You got, had a little bit too much to drink and some friend decides to post the video on Facebook. Fuck that guy. I mean, first of all, but I mean, um, it's just too so, much for me. I got a story, and, and you'll love this, because it's exactly what you're talking about. We were in Houston on the last Nile tour, and we had been really grinding it. Uh, hadn't stopped for a moment's bit of fun. But it just so happened that we didn't have bus call until 5 a.m., and right around the corner from where we have just finished playing... There was a bar open all night, they had karaoke, and it was really, there's everybody that had been at the show went over there, right? So after we got cleaned up, we went over there too. And of course, when you're hanging out with fans, they want to buy you drinks. They want to buy you drinks, right? Now, I'm a, I'm a tequila drinker, right? But if you're drinking tequila, you don't mix it with brown liquor, you, you, you just don't do it, right? Um, because it'll make you sick very quick. 
like before you even realize what's happened you're like oh fuck and your world feels like it's about to end but when you're hanging out with fans then they're going here have, here's a shot 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 there's a lot of shots happen in a very small amount of time and all it takes is one of those to be whiskey if you're drinking tequila all right so of course like uh i had to leave the club so i'm going back to the bus and i'm i'm feeling it you know wait a minute i think one of these was not tequila so and it's starting to rain right uh so i'm outside the bus and i'm like puking up my guts because that's that's what happens that's what happens you drink tequila you mix in some brown liquor you are gonna throw up so like some guys come wandering over you know fans right and the first fucking thing they do instead of carl can we help are you, you okay yeah are you okay what what can we do can we get you? they pull out the cell phones and start videoing but luckily my guitar tech was nearby. He saw them. He fucking ran those fuckers off. I mean, but that's that's what people do nowadays. They they see you when you're having a moment that's not your best moment. They want to document it and say, dude. Honestly. And thank God for your guitar tech. Honest. Yeah. Good job, guitar tech. I think if they had been like, dude, are you okay? Can we get you water? Guitar tech would have been like, no problem. Go get him a water. But I mean, the phone coming out. Uh, yeah, yeah. So perfect, perfect uh, answer there. I remember reading an old article it's like five or six years ago where you used to actually use Cakewalk. And this really piques my interest because my first DAW was Cakewalk Pro Audio 9 in 2001-ish. Yeah, 2001. And I used Cakewalk right up until uh, Gibson shut it down. And, um, so, I mean, I was exclusively like, I was on the cakewalk fanboy, like, woo, cakewalk, woo. And that's, I mean, that was me. And then they shut it down. And then I, you know, tried Reaper. I tried studio one. And then finally went to Cubase where I'm like pretty happy. But, um, why did you switch to Cubase originally? And, uh, you know, you know, maybe, and when did you make the switch? Uh, you know, all that is, is such a, a funny tale. I started with cakewalk. Cakewalk Pro Audio 5. Um, uh, Because we were, you know, making song demos at home and writing songs and used it for years and years and years. Um, I especially liked it live because it has a playlist, right? There's a playlist function in in Cakewalk all the way through Sonar. Um, And it's extremely useful for live. Um... But, uh, somewhere, uh, around Cubase 5 or so, uh, George started using Cubase because he got the, there was a version of Cubase 5 that was cracked that went all over and that's the one George used, right? So George starts using Cubase. So I go, all right, wait a minute. If George is using Cubase, I should get cubase and at least learn how to use it so that i can take my cakewalk files and smack them over into cubase and send them the cubase project and blah 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 so thoughtful well you know it's about actually not being thoughtful or nice it's about uh i want to get something accomplished right (laughs) so you do what you have to do to reach the end objective and the end objective is everybody in the band is playing the same fucking song (laughs) got it so it was more of listen this is how the song goes i'm gonna put it in your daw so you don't fuck it up here it is (laughs) i got i I, that's translation right i got it you you got it yeah that's that's very well good (laughs) um so uh we went on like that for a while and uh i became very close with the cakewalk guys um it's one of their artist reps dan gonzalez um happened to be a Nile fan right about this time they came out with the x series in, in sonar 
but they changed all the keyboard shortcuts. And this, for me, this was big, right? Because I'd already been using Sonar Cakewalk for years already, right? So all my keyboard shortcuts were like, not just in my brain, but like, you know, in physical, like, you know, muscle memory, like my hand's gonna go there, right? It'll just go there to that to place on the keyboard just without even thinking about it. So when they changed the sh keyboard shortcuts, I went, wait a minute, wait a minute. I could, a, relearn a bunch of new keyboard shortcuts. They didn't have the import keyboard shortcuts feature yet. That was a, an update that came a little later. So I went, wait a minute. I could either learn new Cakewalk shortcuts, or I'm trying to work with George using Cubase. I would be investing the same amount of effort learning all the Cubase shortcuts. And... I have the added benefit of now I'm uh, conversational with the rest of the band. Right. Oh, you so, were the odd man out in Cakewalk, huh? Yeah. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> got it. So I, I got myself a, and it was Cubase 6 by now. Um, got myself Cubase 6 and uh, actually got a bunch of video courses Right, and I just took myself to my own self-imposed. I was off off a tour, you know, on a break. I had a couple months, so I just went to college every day. I put the video course on the top screen, and down here on this screen, I would put my copy of Cubase and whatever Greg Ando did up there. I did down here. I just follow along, and I fucking learned. And wow. Uh, but the part that kills me is uh, Cubase has a wonderful feature called the Arranger. And for songwriting, it's the bomb. It's a weapon for writing metal songs. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the Arranger function, but holy shit, is it powerful. Might need to pay oh. you for some lessons, Carl. <laughs> it's one of the lessons uh, I give you know for metal guys uh, who are just... Uh, Wanting to get going, write a song in Cubase, right? So I got it. It's I can load it up, but so it's a non-linear playback thing. So when I went to Nam and I, I was hanging out with the Cakewalk guys, and they say to me, "Carl, what feature would you like to see in an upcoming version of Cakewalk that would be helpful?" I went, "Well, guys, this fucking arranger thing in Cubase is the fucking bomb." Dude, the what it allows you to do, uh, arranging your songs, is just unprecedented. And it's exactly what a computer DAW should be doing anyway. <laughs> well, they didn't like that. The, the one guy, he was a coder, and I can't rem remember his name, but uh, obviously he was one of the, the guys responsible for writing a lot of the feature sets. He had a conniption fit. Apparently, a bunch of people had been saying very similar things to him all day that day at NAM. So, you know, when you're at NAM, you know, you're bombarded. You might talk to a thousand people, you know, and they've each got, got their own stupid thing to say. So I was probably, to him, I was the last straw of stupidity. <laughs> he had a conniption fit. He threw this big temper tantrum. Uh, uh, if you want that to fucking feature, I'm not gonna fucking think you go. Go ahead, go to Cubase. I don't care, man. It was it was ten minutes of this guy losing his mind. Poor guy. So right about then, that's when I I like made the wholehearted, full fledged. You see you guys. Uh, I still use Cakewalk Live because of the playlist. Um, there's a lot of flexibility with that. Yes, so I it just tickled me pink that you actually used Cakewalk because it's like no one used fucking Cakewalk, or it was just one of those things that after eight point five just whoop died. Yep. Um, so you did mention about the the arrangement feature, right? 
about Cubase and stuff like that. But is there anything else about Cubase about composing? Because like I like I say, like I have to be honest, I just plugged the Arturia in and it worked in Cubase. I just put the moniker input moniker in, in the in the inspector set the channel got sound. I'm just like. <laughs> Wow! Uh, Cubase makes it easy, dude. Yeah, just to get going. It's, yeah, it's a godsend. Um, let me see for a second right here. If, which project I got open here? This is Bionilotic Rights. Okay, I could go out of that. Close that down. Uh, do you, you write the riff and then you tap the tempo? Or do you have an idea for a tempo right. and then write the riff? Okay, we're going to lose. I'm going to close this out. Um, this is Bionalog Rights. I'm going to open up another thing here. Excellent. Okay, um, if you notice on here, you'll see um, these are just like guitar riffs, right? If I turn off Easy Drummer, you hear that? Yeah. These are just guitar riffs. Like, here's a guitar riff, here's another riff. Right, it's uh, basically you see a screen full of riffs, right? That are recorded just wherever. Like I, I found the tempo, did the tap tempo, and recorded it to a click, right? Um, and then I like put drums to each one of those riffs, which that's a whole other lesson. We're not going to go there, but basically, we have a bunch of riffs here. We got a bunch of riffs, and it's like in a sketchpad format. But this this track right here is called the arranger track, all right. And you just take a little pencil and you draw in little events, right? And then you name the event. So I've got like a bunch of events named, right? And there's one for each of the sections. It even lets you chop sections up, like there's a section within a section, all right? All right, maybe I don't want to do the bridge that long every time. Maybe I just want half the bridge sometimes. All right, so you got a, a list of arranger events that corresponds to, you know, all these, every single one of those riff ideas. So... As I'm clicking on this, you'll see that it's skipping around in a nonlinear fashion according to whatever I want to pick at any given moment, right? So after you figure out, all right, well, I want my riff intro, then we're going to get me in, then let's be merciful, then there's that chord. Maybe I want to do this one next and this one. No, wait a minute. Let's do this one there. Let's do this one twice. Let's... Let's do this three times. Um, then maybe let's do another verse. A double kick. And let's do the gallop. Fuck, I like that gallop. Right. All right. So at some point, I'm going to reach a point where I'm happy with this arrangement, right? Because if I, if I just hit the play, it's going to play all these events in their nonlinear fashion and just, you know, be jumping all around the screen. Whenever you reach a point where, okay, I think that's the arrangement, you go over to this flatten window, all right, and watch what happens when I flatten. Boom! Boom! Arrange my entire song in the blink of an eye.
Now, if I were trying to do that shit in Cakewalk, right? Yeah, for every single, you know, all right, here's my guitar riff. And then you got to make sure to grab your tempo and make sure to grab your time signature when you make this copy and the paste and the rearrange. You know, it's maddening. It's frustrating because if you accidentally don't get the fucking tempo shift, you just made a, yeah, make a mess out of your grid. But this handles all of that fucking flawlessly and seamlessly like, like a DAW should. So now I got a finished arrangement of whatever I put in that chain. So that's a really cool idea, actually. So what? So you'll open up, for example, just a Cubase session. You'll have like two riff ideas. You'll record them separately, tap out the tempos, and then just decide later on. You'll try to just like arrange the pieces together, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Which is it's what you do in your brain anyway. You're like you're sitting there. Yep, I got a riff, and I got this riff, you know. Maybe we should make this the chorus. Maybe that's the verse. We'll do that twice. And uh, Well, this helps you helps you visualize it and see it um, and organize your own brain, which is really what this is doing. It's you're using an external brain organization. That's incredible, actually. I mean, uh, me being nearly 100% visual, for me to understand what I'm trying to do, uh, I like this a lot. I didn't even know this feature existed. Unfortunately, it's because I'm not writing a lot right now. I'm mostly working on other people's stuff. So I generally just get the multi-tracks and then put the markers in and then I'm good. But this also, time saver. I just got a, oh, I got three riffs. I got an idea for it. Let me record it real quick. Time, tempo, done, save. Come back at it tomorrow. And then within a couple of days, you got 19 riffs and you're like, delete 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 <laughs> exactly exactly because it's like a sketch pad you put your ideas in there as they occur to you right which which i think is another part of songwriting is like the time it takes you to have an idea right and then go record that idea if you can shorten that amount of time between all right here's my idea i gotta go mic up the cab then I got to figure out the, the this and the blah, 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 right? Half the time, I like I don't even feel like fucking playing the riff anymore by the time I, I know get it. everything yep. going, right? It wasn't but that this, good of an idea anyway. I've already written a riff like that before. Fuck it. <laughs> right, which may be true or not true. Like, it's very easy, based on convenience, to make decisions. Like, I got this thing... Um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a remote controlled uh, mic stand, right? Like the dyna the Dynamount or something like that. The Dynamount, yes, the fucking Dynamount. All right, right. It's it's the same principle, right? A bunch of times when you're moving a uh, fifty seven around, trying to find the sweet spot, right? And when you're doing it old school, you know. You move the mic, you come back in the control room, you play, you listen to it, and you go, oh, no, you go back and you move it a little more, and you come back and you try it. And you, you know, lather, rinse, repeat endlessly until hopefully you decide, oh, that's exactly the sound I've been striving to hear. Yes. But that's not really true. Often you will make that decision that it's, Oh, yeah, that's the sweet spot. Because you're fucking fed up with the whole getting up and down and going back in here. After fucking five hours, six hours of it, you can't even tell anyway, right? Your ears are cooked. You can't tell. You So, yeah, okay, I guess it is good enough. Yeah, I, that's pretty much, that's a, you can do that too with uh, amp simulators. And speaking of, you said Mike in the cab. Um, I know you've gone on your record. I don't remember what interview it was where you said the neural DSP nameless would be the amp simulator. Like if someone twisted your arm, like you've got to use an amp sim to record an album. You said you'd do it with the nameless. Uh, that was a couple of years ago, I think already, like two years ago. I think you said that. Um, is there ever going to be a time where you think amp simulators could get to the point where you're going to be like, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to go with the amp simulator on this album. Sounds great. Or is it always going to be, nope, micing up a cab? That's, that's just, Amp Sims will never quite do it for you. 
You know, we're already at the point where, to my ear, if I'm doing a guitar lead in its single notes, the amp sims are already good enough to do guitar leads, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, well, should you need more detail on the tone for the lead? You know. But what I've noticed, the parts that I'm unhappy with on amp sims is heavily saturated chords where you have more than one note. And I think there's still some intermodulation distortion that's we just don't quite have the processing power for it yet maybe in a couple more years maybe they'll they'll finally get that to where people will not grumble when they hear it because i'm one of those grumblers right i've been playing since i was nine years old through a tube amp every day when i practice i'm practicing through I don't know if you can see it, um, my camera, but there's a Marshall cab over there. It's it's an old vintage one, and my Splawn head. That's what I practice through every day for hours, every fucking day. My ears used to hearing that tube tone, right? And and I'm also used to the way it it reacts in my hand, right? And this is a subtle difference. That really, I mean, it it just kills me, but it's real. The way the guitar reacts and feels in your hand when you're playing through a tube amp as opposed to you're in a DI and you're going into your PC and you got your amp sim loaded up, the whole chain, it makes the guitar react different and feel different. And, and that's where the, the little line is for me. I, I think they're almost there. I think like in the last five years, They've come so far. Oh my God, the the development that's gone on is just mind boggling. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you can remember playing the old school pods. I mean, you were <laughs> uh, the old the old school noise buzz machines. You know, I remember playing one of those old school pods, going, what "The fuck is this?" Yeah, yeah. Uh, line six. The fuck, no, fuck off with that. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, no. Not doing that. Uh, I think I uh, I was in a band where a guy had a fully fucking line six rig, and a guy who played a crate with a blue voodoo amp. Uh, sorry. Oh cabinet. my god! Wow. Uh, and crates are not exactly top of the line tube amps, okay, people. But I mean, I always preferred listening to him when we played live. I was the drummer. I always needed him on my right because he had the mids and I could fucking hear him. This guy was just a ball of fuzz, and I didn't understand shit what he was doing live. So I always needed him here, uh, so I, the mids would come and reverberate to me, and I would hear what's going on. Because the crate with the blue voodoo, perfect. Line six with the line six. <laughs> well, at least live. I mean, live. You know, as, as George, you got to have mids when you're a drummer. You can't hear shit uh, in Dude, the high uh... register. We actually have, have, over time, learned this lesson ourselves. Like, the guitar tone that George gets in his headphones nowadays is completely different than what's come out of my amp. Um, just so that he can hear it in his fucking headphones. If you've ever seen this live, it's, it's almost ridiculous. Uh, George, every once in a while, he'll start playing one-handed, and he's got his other hand on his mixer, and he's fucking trying to dial his thing in so he can get what he needs and part of the equation is the guitar tone that's like in his ear it's you know it's crucial that it's it's not got too much fizz you can hear what's actually being played um which is totally not what we're trying to do with a big crushing <laughs> death metal I know. right it's like all the mids wait what all the mids Talk, what are you talking about? <laughs> but that's the truth. I mean, because uh -huh. you think about symbols, psh, psh, yep. psh, psh, right? Top end of the snare crack, yep. hi hats. It's all high in energy, and your guitar sound goes bye bye, live. Yep. Fuck See all. ya. 
talking about your guitar. You guys playing drop A. I, everyone knows that your rhythm guitars are in drop A. However, I have never actually seen in print or heard you anywhere explain how you came to playing in drop A. Because I would oh. assume you, you made this you made this decision easily in the early nineties. This was yep. I'm assuming before the new metal corn craze bullshit. And it's not like, and it's also counterintuitive because if you think of the kind of riffs that you play, drop A would be sort of working against you because you're playing fast, you have a lot of intricate notes. So how the hell did you decide, like, drop A, that's the one for us? Well, it's a great question, and and the story goes, uh, we were originally in drop D. We're playing a lot of songs uh, in drop D. Uh, and it was almost heavy enough. Almost. Almost. It's like, you know, let's go down a half step from here. I bet that'll sound really... That'll be, that'll be the ticket. That'll make it heavy enough. So we did. Uh, so now we're in C sharp. All right. Well, this this sounds pretty fucking heavy. This is early '90s, guys. Early '90s. You got to think. I'm trying to place this for people because people are like C sharp. That's fine. This is early '90s, guys. So, okay, continue. Just wanted to set so, the scene. <laughs> so we went. All right. This is pretty cool, but you know, C sharp. You know, I don't know. Let's try C. So we play in C for a while. And, you know, okay. So that starts sounding happy to me because it reminded me of a C chord on a piano. So, like, we can't have a root note that's just fucking C. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's not evil. There's nothing evil about it. Everything now sounds fucking like it's in a major key, even though we're playing minor chords everywhere. So, all right, so let's go down another half step. And uh, right about this time, we started going, wait a minute, we got to start getting some bigger strings because this shit's flopping all around. So now starts this, this dance, all right, trying to find a string that'll stay stable. And wait a minute, you know, we, we should go down to B. What about B flat? And then, well, fuck, if we're in B flat, why don't we just go to fuck to A? Let's try A. And that was the sound. That was like when I hit that fucking chord that had this somehow this earthy like resonance, like it resonated like the planet Earth resonates. You know, so I was like, okay, okay, all right. So then I found a 70 gauge um, made by the company that I was already playing their strings. So this was like, wow. This is perfect. This is going to work. So we started rolling in it, and there was just something about that open A power chord that just resonated. It had the weight that we needed to write fucking songs about pyramids and, you know, ancient tombs. And, and you need something that goes, gong. I mean, yeah, that makes sense now. I just can't believe where that idea came to you. Because it's almost like there are steps. You know, like, drop D, that's fucking heavy, dude. You can't go lower than drop D. I mean, what, are you fucking crazy? <laughs> but then, I mean, and then now it's like drop D. It's like, drop D, what are you, little baby? You want to play some happy music? I mean, it's funny how things have changed so much like that. So it's very curious to me how, I mean, you just kept going lower and lower and lower. And then the interesting thing, too, is you've been drop A the entire time. Mm -hmm. That's also pretty unusual because a lot of bands will be like, They'll change, or they'll try a song in different tuning eventually. But I, I, it's pretty incredible. You just like drop A. That's it. That's the one. Thirty years later, drop A. Well, you know when you're playing live too, right? We discovered this very early on. So we still had a song or two that was in E, right? So we'd have to trade guitars to play this other fucking song. And we went, well. Do we really want to play that song bad enough to fucking have to change guitars? So now it's like we're not changing because if you did try to change, it wouldn't have that sound anyway, and it would be a pain in the ass. So pain in the ass, 
Lose a unique thing that's uniquely ours. I don't see the fucking benefit in even considering it. I, I like the way it sounds. So, Carl, you know, about nine years ago, you uh, made a YouTube channel and you made two instructional guitar videos. What the fuck? Are we going <laughs> to see any more or did you end your YouTube career? Well, uh, I got busy with other shit for a while. Um, I guess I got busy for a long while. Um, uh, but now I've discovered this wonderful thing called OBS where like, you know, I'm on here giving guitar lessons every day anyway. So maybe I can, you know, when I finish this record I'm working on now, which is like my life saying for everything in my life right now. When I finish this record I'm working on now, then maybe I got some time to play some guitar and uh, do some OBS video. Cool, man. So I'm looking forward to that. If you actually got time to do the YouTube videos, um, people will love that shit. Um, especially with the OBS, how you already have everything set up. with You can show stuff. Yeah, it's way easier once you get it set up. It sucks to set it up, but once it's set up, it works quite nicely. Um, here's another funny story. Uh, uh, right when I went to start giving guitar lessons, um, I also realized that, wow, I can give cubase lessons too all right what do i got to do to make cubase lessons happen there's another trick because streaming your daw into obs uh with osio well now you're fucked luckily reaper to the rescue um in the ria ria stream um but i had to fucking figure that shit out the hard way watched a million stupid little videos on youtube so, by the way, I get this all set up, and uh, on my normal household desktop, not my main DAW, because for whatever reason, my camera wasn't supported with my chipset, so, ugh. but it all worked fine on my household computer. So, I'm installing, and yeah, I get all of it fucking working, right, because... I got Cubase lessons coming out. I got four of them that I've already sold, right? So it has to work, right? I got to make it work, right? Um, well, my fucking C drive gives up the fucking ghosts. Hadn't bothered to back any of this stuff up because it's not my main DAW, which, you know, I got a, a separate backup drive for because, you know... Blah, you know the drill. But not for my household computer, because it's just the fucking household computer, and I'm only going to be doing YouTube Skype lessons. So now I have nothing. I have to fucking figure out how to do all that shit on my fucking laptop, right? So I had to learn, you know, I'm still learning OBS at this point. So by the time I got fucking finished learning how to do it all on a laptop run cubase skype and obs simultaneously on my laptop and manage all the inputs too right uh, off my fucking laptop so i learned how to fucking do it you because you have to when you have to do something that's when you actually learn right yeah so like oh i gotta give lessons tomorrow nothing is ready let's begin <laughs> But I did it. I did. I made it in time. And uh, actually, uh, Rusty Cooley helped me. Um, so I take guitar lessons from Rusty. So I, he was very helpful in like, okay, if you're giving lessons, this is this is what you need to do. And this is what people need to see. And um, he's going to be on this uh, Saurian album. He's got a, coup a couple of acoustic guitar solos. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's mind-melting acoustic shredding. Um, I couldn't do that shit. Holy shit. I've been playing, like, you know, my whole life, right? But when he's around, I don't touch the guitar. I just watch. So, when you're not busy writing amazing riffs, you like to throw your weight around with your super impressive Call of Duty scores. Um, 
You know, gotta say, uh, I'm a Quake player myself. Are you? Are you? You played Quake before, or not really? I do. I love Quake. I've played so much Quake in my life. It's it's ridiculous. I played so much Quake when Quake first came out. I don't know if you remember this about the original Quake, but whatever CD was in your drive, that's the music that the Quake game would access to play along with the game. So my Festivals of Atonement CD was in the CD drive, and it would play along whenever I played Quake. So there was like so much of that that now that first Quake game it's indelibly impressed. All the soundtrack of it is Festivals of Atonement in my mind. So that even if I'm playing Quake nowadays and I don't have a Festivals of Atonement CD, I still fucking hear it. It's it's part of the experience to me. I remember that the somehow like the audio was separated. I don't remember how what, what the technical term of it is, but I mean that's like like the re-releases on GOG and stuff without music because it's separate but you can just get this stuff online and include it in the folders but yeah i mean um i was let's see in high school when the first call of duties came out really loved the single player campaigns yeah i buy i buy the multiplayer ones and i fuck around them with them for about 40 50 hours i'm just kind of like but uh quake champions and just quake live i can't stop dude it's so much fun Especially nowadays, because our computers are so much faster now. So it, a simple game like Quake just fucking screams. Yep. It's so Two, much fun. 250 frames a second. I, don't know, I got a 144 hertz monitor, so it's ultra butterly smooth. Um, it's really great. Frames are important with FPS. People, consoles with their frames fucking Frames win games. Frames win games. <laughs> yep. In fact, yeah, I have a screenshot. Let me see if I can find it. Are you going to drop a new uh, new now. kill death ratio record on us right now? Uh, I am. As soon as I find this <laughs> picture, is this it? This new screenshot, my kill death ratio is currently 12.43. <laughs> that's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I've never <laughs> had a kill death ratio that high in Call of Duty. However, my online multiplayer kill death ratio in Quake Champions is 1.4. Dude, that's pretty substantial because <laughs> Quake so, is full of some really good motherfucking players. Oh, dude, every other game I get my cheeks clapped. But, I mean, you just got to keep rolling with it. I mean, it's taking yeah. months. But, I mean, yeah, Quake is just a game. At the, at, I think maybe you have the same thing. Like, I know you play Doom, but Doom is one of those games where it doesn't require, like, like The Witcher where you have to read 300 pages of lore to understand what you're supposed to right. fucking do now. I don't have time. For that, even though I really no. wish I could play The Witcher, I fucking cannot. However, I right. can load Quake anytime I'm in a game within minutes, and I can play for half hour, and I'm done. So that's yep. kind of how it is here. Doom, I yep. was the same for me. Um, but there are, are there any games where you literally have just written a Nile song because of it? Yes. Um, some early Quake levels, like the Elder God Shrine, that's like on one of the Saurian records. That's, um, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were a few Nile tracks that actually were inspired by early uh, Doom and Quake. Yeah, I mean. So you're a normal person, Carl. God. <laughs> <laughs> you're not. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. Only Luciferian, Lovecraft, HP shit games. What is that? That's for little babies. No games. <laughs> only only evil topics and themes can have any fun. This is metal. You understand? <laughs> a sincere thank you, dude. I mean, this is... Uh, thank you, Scott. So I knew this was going to be a lot of fun. I just knew it. I appreciate that a lot, man. I mean, it's hard to put into words, you know. I mean, I don't want to use the word... I don't like using specific words, but I can say that you're a huge, probably the biggest influence for me when it comes to guitar, guitar sounds. Uh, riffing, I love. I just love the way the Nile r riffs bounce. You know, there's a just the way that they flow. I really enjoy that. The technicality with the melody. You know, I think that's what makes you guys really unique. And so it's again an amazing privilege to be able to sit with you today. And really, thank you. Uh, don't know what else to say. So 
I would really just prefer to leave the last words to you. So please, uh, I know you're working on the new the new album right now. Cubase lessons, guitar lessons. Uh, how can people get a hold of you if they want to learn guitar or Cubase or um, Nile Guitar Lessons at gmail dot com. Awesome. Um, just drop an email there, or just go to my official Facebook page. There's a link on there. Um, it's not too hard. Yeah. Somebody will fuck it up, I'm sure. <laughs> Carl, honestly, um, thank you a lot. Uh, thank you, Scott. This has been a blast, man. I really like the work you're doing. Um, yeah, it's really solid stuff. Um, I think a lot of people can benefit from what you have to offer. Um, yeah, and you're a fucking killer Cubase guy. So it's, it's, it's awesome, man. Yeah. All right. We'll have to connect again. Maybe we'll uh, have a part two update. And you know what? Actually, guys, if you have any questions for Carl, comment down below. Uh, when there's a good eight to 12 questions, and I mean good, okay? Put some effort into this. Don't ask him questions. Look, you gotta, look, <laughs> he's been doing this for 30 years, okay? So you got to kind of keep that in mind. You know, uh, probably has answered some of these questions before. Um, it took me forever to think of these questions for Carl because every time I thought I had an idea, oh, there it is, the answer in the fucking interview he did seven years ago. Fuck. <laughs> so, um, you know. Well, ask, not everyone you know. is as thoughtful as you are, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> so, come on, put some effort into it. I'm sure Carl would be delighted to come back if the questions are cool. So, leave a comment below, leave a question, and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Have a good one.